We hope you're enjoying your visit here this evening. Now, on with the show. Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, where I recommend movies and we talk about them. Uh, last time we did director or authors as directors triple feature you know d authors directing um their own work adapting their own work although uh this first one is westworld as directed by michael crichton and i don't think that he wrote a book of this maybe he did i don't know uh most people probably know westworld for the uh hbo series based on it um I haven't watched the show, but from what I can tell, it doesn't really follow the plot of the movie. It's more the concept of Westworld. So in the mu in the movie Westworld, it's this big amusement park, uh, or yeah, we'll, we'll call it an amusement park, a big resort where you can stay in like Westworld, Roman world, or medieval world, and. There's a bunch of uh, very realistic humanoid robots that go around and sort of make those places, f make, make it feel like you're genuinely in the Wild West or you're genuinely in ancient Roman times or you're genuinely in medieval times. Uh, the main characters of this movie, James Brolin and Richard Benjamin, he's definitely been in other stuff I've seen. And uh, James Brolin, of course, popular actor, father of uh, Josh Brolin. Uh, they go to Westworld, and there's this, like, gunslinger robot, and they get to, like, ah, shoot out with them. Haha, <laughs> it's, it's a ton of fun. We get to shoot the bad guys. It's just like the old West. Woohoo. But then in the movie, there's this, like, virus, this computer virus that is spreading between the robots. And causing all sorts of weird malfunctions. And suddenly the robots are killing all of the guests. So uh, this is from Michael Crichton, the guy who wrote Jurassic Park. And it's basically just Jurassic Park if the dinosaurs were robot cowboys. Like, it's, it's the same fucking plot as Jurassic Park. It's like, look at this. We, we've opened up this... Uh, attraction that's uh, gonna draw everyone in oh no the attraction's gone wrong and is killing people it's it's jurassic park with robot cowboys instead of dinosaurs it's still a great movie it's still a really fun movie um fucking yule brenner plays the he's here on the cover he's the uh robot gunslinger who's Sort of the main villain, even though, like, all of the robots are the main villain. Um, he's, he's the one who's, like, relentlessly pursuing, uh, James Brolin and his friend. Although, spoilers, James Brolin dies, like, right as the robot uprising is starting. So, mostly he's chasing Richard Benjamin around. And, and Ewell Brenner is really, really good in this role. He's, he's like, perfect, stoic, bad guy robot. Um, I think uh, John Carpenter even said Ewell Brenner's performance in this movie was the inspiration for Michael Myers and how Michael Myers just, like, relentlessly pursued people. So I don't know how much of that is on the TV show because I've never watched the TV show. But from what I have gathered, it's mostly just the robot Old West Town. Um, that's, that's all they took for the TV show. Which, you know, that's a good setup. Um, if, you, if you don't want to adapt the robot uprising. So there, there were follow-ups to this movie. There was a sequel called Future World, not written or directed by Michael Crichton. And then there was a TV show that was called, like, Beyond Westworld that lasted for, like, a season, and that was it. Um, this is a really fun movie. Lots of really good performances. Yule Brenner, absolutely terrifying. You know, it, it's, it's a really interesting setup because it's, like, this, this uh, amusement park where you can go pretend to kill people. 
they they say in the movie like oh they give you a real gun but you know it's it's heat sensitive so you can't shoot real people with it and i'm like bullshit bullshit no fucking amusement park is giving out real guns even even if they're designed not to kill humans it's like yeah that's that's how you someone blows their damn hand off right you know they're going to find some way to to shoot people with these guns they're they're gonna break the heat sensor or something and something's gonna go wrong and you're gonna shoot someone <laughs> like dismissing the robot uprising someone was getting hurt here eventually you can't just give people real fucking guns to shoot at people with it'd make way more sense if they were like uh, you, you know, like, the, those rides with the light guns where you, you shoot it, there's, like, there was the Buzz Lightyear one at Disneyland for a while, and there was a Scooby-Doo one at a couple of, uh, Six Flags parks, although they've, they've been shut down now. There's only one of those Scooby-Doo rides left, and it's, like, Italy, in Italy. I'm like, man, I miss those rides. I love those rides. Um... There was a Buzz Lightyear one at Disney World. I don't know if that's still there. I think they replaced it with Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, there's one at the Six Flags near me that's a Justice League one, but uh, it's always closed. Like, I, I have been to Six Flags like four times since it opened, and I have seen it open once. I've gotten to ride that ride one time. And even then, it was closed for, like, most of the day. It's just, like, on my way out of the park, I'm like, Oh, crap, it's open. Better write it now, because I don't know when I'm going to get the next chance to. But, yeah, give give guests, like, light guns, and then... Because they're robots. You don't have to shoot a robot with a real gun. It's like, oh, no, the light thing hit them. Uh, blood squib, blood squib, oh, I'm dead. I tell you what I'd do, if I were there, I'd take the gun and I'd just start shooting every fucker in the place. Because I know I can't hurt any of the humans, so I'm just gonna start firing in all directions and kill every single robot in the room. That sounds like a lot of fun, and probably not what I'm supposed to do in Westworld. Richard Benjamin's character does get thrown in jail at one point by the sheriff robot. Um... <laughs> But then they blow up the jail and get him out. I don't know where they got the ability to blow up the jail. Because that was a real explosion. Are the explosions heat sensitive? Can the explosions tell if there's a human being too close? That seems incredibly dangerous. On the other hand, this movie came out in the 70s. So, you know, the time that they had a uh, fucking... Action Park? Was that what it's called? Action Point? Something like that. Where where people just got fucking hurt all the time. <laughs> so, you know, maybe this would have flown in the 70s. Who knows? Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy this movie. It's a lot of fun. If you're a fan of the TV show, I, I can't promise it's anything like the TV show, but watch it anyways. Who cares? It's It's a really fun movie. Uh, not the only thing Michael Crichton has directed. Uh, he directed a movie called Coma, which was okay. And he directed a movie called Looker, which I really love. It's, like, like weirdly predicted deepfakes? Michael Crichton predicted deepfakes in the mid-80s? So, good on Michael Crichton. He's, he's ahead of his time. Um... Yeah, Michael Crichton directed a few movies. Uh, hmm. I want to say this was his best, but I, I also really like Looker. I don't know if I could pick this over Looker. But I don't know if I could pick Looker over this either. They're both really good movies. Um, I think he's directed a few I haven't seen, too. Um, but he, he, he did a couple movies. This was not his only movie. I should also mention, so just since it's... You know, uh, authors directing their own work week. Mention some of the other authors who've directed their own work. Because these are not the only three movies of authors directing their own work. Uh, William Peter Blady, Blady? William Peter Blady of The Exorcist fame. 
uh, directed uh, The Exorcist 3, first off. He was so upset by Exorcist 2, he's like, no, fuck you, I'm directing Exorcist 3. You're not gonna do Exorcist 2 to me again. I get to direct Exorcist 3. Uh, and he also directed The Ninth Configuration, which is a great movie. I love Ninth Configuration. Maybe maybe we could do another author's directing their own work night, and we'll do we'll do Looker, and we'll do Ninth Configuration. And <laughs> maybe we'll even throw in the movie I watched earlier this week. I just drunk tweeted it. Tough Guys Don't Dance was directed by its author. That movie is fucking Buck wild, man. I... Incomprehensible. No basis in reality. It's wild. It's insane. I love that movie. <laughs> Norman Mailer. Norman Mailer wrote the book Tough Guys Don't Dance, and then he directed the movie. And I'm pretty sure it's the only movie he's ever directed. But if you've seen Tough Guys Don't Dance, you know why it's the only movie he's ever directed. Speaking of authors who decided to direct their own work and then decided never to do it again. Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive. Uh, Maximum Overdrive, written and directed by Stephen King, who has a nice little uh, Alfred Hitchcock-style cameo at the beginning, uh, is about, like, a, a comet passes Earth, and Earth is in, like, the tail of this comet. And as long as Earth is in the tail of this comet, all of the machinery on Earth is, like, going haywire and killing people. Most especially, uh, cars and trucks. So most of the movie takes place at this truck stop with all these, uh, big semi-trucks driving around the, the truck stop try, trying to, like, get at these people, trying to kill these people. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's... It's, it's a lot of fun. It's wild, but it's fun. I enjoyed this one. I'm not gonna pretend it's good, but it's... It's so fucking over the top. Like, pretty much everything that comes on screen blows up eventually. Like, if... Like, a car, or a truck, or a... a anything. Anything that comes on screen is, like... Eight to one odds, that thing is gonna blow up. Uh, reportedly, this was during Stephen King's cocaine phase, and according to him, he was coked out of his mind the entire time he was directing this. Um, and it kind of shows, I guess, there is a good energy to this movie. <laughs> that is not, that is not an endorsement of cocaine. Don't do cocaine. You can make good movies without cocaine. This is not even a good movie. This is... A very dumb, very silly movie, but a very enjoyable one nonetheless. I might have to do a filmography of one episode on this, because honestly, I think uh, Stephen King could direct another movie. I'd, I'd like to see another movie from Stephen King. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed this was the only one he decided to make. Because <laughs> I think if he was not coked out of his mind, and if he had, like, a more coherent script... He could probably do it, because this, this movie works in a lot of ways. It's high energy, it's a lot of fun. Uh, ACDC soundtrack, which they've even they've even advertised on this Vestron video release. They're like, oh, soundtrack by ACDC. That was like a big selling point when it came out, is ACDC did the soundtrack. Woo. And it's also why I chose... This triple feature leading into Metal Ween. Uh, Westworld, I don't know, it's kind of metal. But this and uh, Hellraiser, very metal movies. So, good lead into Metal Ween. Uh, stars Elimo Estevez. We finally got one of the Estevezes in one of these. And it was Elimo. I'm surprised Elimo was the first one we got. Because, I like, Martin Sheen is in so many great cult movies. Joe Estevez is in a lot of, not good, but enjoyable cult movies. Uh, even Charlie Sheen, I think I expected to see before Elimo. But here's Elimo Estevez in this one. 
Uh, I think would make an interesting double feature, honestly, with uh, Repo Man, another um, Elimo Estevez joint. Uh, although, if you paired this up with Repo Man, it's like Repo Man is the main event and this is the B-movie. But, you know, they're both like punk rock, heavy metal inspired... Movies, sci-fi movies, weird, weird sci-fi movies about, you know, cars. Cars are the main focus of both of those movies, and they both star Elimo Estevez. But uh, Repo Man is, like, a million times better than Maximum Overdrive. Like, I know I'm praising Maximum Overdrive because I had fun watching it. It's not as good as Repo Man. Repo Man's fucking brilliant. Weirdly, they they kind of explain why everything's going wrong. They, like, Ellie Moestevez sort of theorizes that, like, oh, the, the comet that passed us is, like, something the aliens built to kill off all of humanity so they can have the planet to themselves. You know, it was like a, a cleaner just to, like, clean off the Earth so that the aliens could move in. Um, and that sort of gets confirmed in the ending. At the end, there's, like, text on the screen. Very, uh, uh, unbreakable ending where they... <laughs> it's like, oh, the Russian satellite blew up a mysterious flying saucer days after this. Um, <laughs> so I, gu I guess his theory is confirmed near the end. That's... That's one of the bigger elements that uh, leaves a big question mark is like, what? why the fuck is this happening? But furthermore, it seems like whatever the aliens have designed to wipe out humans also speaks English, A, and B, is incredibly rude. Like, for, for seemingly no re Like, they're just here to kill us, right? Just to kill us. No other reason. So why do they have to be so rude about it? Because at the very beginning, with uh, when Stephen King's making his cameo appearance, he's outside a bank, and the you know the big flashy banner over the bank suddenly just says like "fuck you, fuck you, fuck you," and then Stephen King's trying to use an ATM, and it says "you're an asshole," and it's like. Why do these aliens know English, and why are they using their knowledge of English? To be an asshole, to, to just be rude to us. What do they gain from that? It's like, okay, we're going to wipe out your entire species, and we're going to be dicks about it. Later in the movie, uh, uh, like a mounted gun from uh, an, an army base shows up, and the horn honks in Morse code. Which, uh, not only do the aliens know English, they know Morse code. But the only way they could figure out to communicate with us was honking a horn in Morse code. They couldn't take over, like, a radio and make the radio say something. Or, or... I don't know, there had to have been a way for them to communicate those words without just honking a horn in Morse code. But there's, like, a kid in the movie who, like, like, everyone, like, his dad's been killed, and, like, everyone in his neighborhood's been killed, and so he's trying to find, like, any sort of civilization, and he ends up in this, uh, uh, truck stop where everyone's holed up, and he's like, oh, yeah, I was in Boy Scouts, I got a merit badge for Morse code. First off, there's not a merit badge for, for Morse code, I don't think, um... But he's like, yeah, I can translate this because I, I learned Morse code from the Boy Scouts. But then, like, as the horn's honking, he's writing down every letter. And I'm like, no way. No way in hell this kid knows Morse code so fucking well. He doesn't even have to write down the dots and the dashes and then translate it. He can just go, oh, that's this letter. Oh, that's this letter. Oh, that's this letter. Oh, that's this. Like, like that's just kind of absurd. 
Like, maybe if there were... Because, like, I, I think they say the owner of the place was, like, in the military. He has, like, a shitload of guns and a bazooka down in the basement. So I have to assume he was in the military. If he had been doing it, it's like, oh, yeah, we had to Morse code all the time in the army. Okay, that'll make sense. This 12-year-old kid, nah, he's not gonna know how to do Morse code that quickly. Apparently, there's a, there's a shot in the movie where a steamroller rolls over a kid, and apparently, uh, Stephen King had left, like, a sack full of fake blood there, so it would sort of, like, smear on the tire of the, the steamroller and, like, leave a trail of blood after it. Instead, when the... <laughs> The steamroller rolled over the sack of blood. It just exploded everywhere. And Stephen King's like, oh, that's great. That's so awesome. And the MPA is like, no, no, you could not have a child exploding into blood in your movie. So they had to, like, trim that down. <laughs> Talk about this release. It's from uh, Western Video, which is uh, Lionsgate's. It's Lionsgate's sort of boutique distribution, like, cult movie distribution label. Uh, I have a couple other releases from them. Uh, it's, uh, Class of 1999, Sundown Vampire and Retreat. Uh, interest, it's, 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 it's an interesting label. Everything they put out, not all of it's good, but all of it is at least entertaining. So I'm very happy for that. It's weird because Western Video was a distribution company, and the, they went defunct in the late 80s and got bought out by Lionsgate. And the stuff Lionsgate is releasing under the Vestron Video label is not exclusively Vestron Video stuff. Some of it is, but it is not exclusively Vestron Video stuff. This was Maximum Overdrive was not a Vestron Video release, but now it's in the Vestron Video collection. Um... Lionsgate, Western Video people, because I know you're watching this, you have to be watching this. Um, Earth Girls Are Easy on Blu-ray. I need Earth Girls Are Easy on Blu-ray. Please. This is the perfect label to put out Earth Girls Are Easy. Holy shit. But yeah, this is, this is fucking loaded up with special features. Uh, although... It does not have... It has an audio commentary with a Stephen King historian and with Jonah Ray of Mystery Science Theater 3000 The Return fame. So there's, like, sort of a riff track on here. But no commentary from Stephen King, who apparently hates this movie. Um, I don't see why. It's a great movie, Stephen. I, I really enjoyed it. I don't know, though, I, I kind of, like, Stephen King does have this reputation as, like, a brilliant author. He's lo written a lot of really smart stuff, you know, he he wrote Shawshank Redemption, he's, he's written a lot of well-respected horror movies. I get why maybe he doesn't want to associate with dumb trash like Maximum Overdrive, but I don't know, man. It's a fun movie, I enjoyed it. If you're looking for... Something crazy and over the top. Fun night with friends. Maximum Overdrive. Great movie. That said, if you're looking for a smart movie, Clive Barker's Hellraiser. We've actually got a nice little overlap here because part of the marketing campaign for Hellraiser revolved around Stephen King's recommendation of it and, and Clive Barker as an author. He, he famously said, I've seen the future of horror, and its name is Clive Barker. So they, they put that in all the trailers for Hellraiser. Uh, Hellraiser, directed by Clive Barker, based on his story, The Hellbound Heart. Um, a, the story of uh, a man who finds this, like, puzzle box that takes him to, like, this BDSM demon realm... <laughs> that's I I mean I like like people will joke about BDSM stuff in movie. It's not a joke. This is a BDSM movie. <laughs> like like 
Clive Barker was going around to, like, BDSM clubs when he wrote this. And, and that was the inspiration for this movie. So he, he goes to this uh, BDSM demon dimension, but then uh, his brother and his brother's wife are moving into this house. And as it happens, his brother, he had an affair with the brother's knight, with the brother's wife the night before their wedding. <laughs> So, and and she clearly prefers him to his brother. She, she, she really wants to fuck him and not the brother. Um, and he's sort of reassembling into our dimension, but he needs, like, the flesh of other people to sort of help restore him. So she's going out and seducing men and bringing them home and murdering them. Um, which is... Plot-wise, it's very, uh, like, Roger Corman-esque. Reminds me of, like, Little Shop of Horrors or Bucket of Blood. But that's such a narrow part of the movie. Like, that's not what the movie is about. It's not about a woman going out and getting people to murder. It's about... This guy bringing himself back from the demon world, and then uh, his his brother's daughter, uh, whose mother is dead. Um, the the woman in this movie is not her mother. She sort of unwittingly releases the demons, and they're like, "Well, we we have to take your soul back with us. Those are the rules." And she's like, "Wait." What if I can help you get my uncle back because he escaped? And they're like, alright, fine. Well, if you help us get your uncle back, we'll, we'll sort of let you off the hook on this one. It's just, it's wild. It's, it's a wild movie and it's fucking brilliant. It, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, like 10 out of 10. Perfect movie. I love this movie so much. There's so, so much to get into with this movie. My, my favorite types of movies are the kinds that, like, they have a lot of, like, profound stuff to say if you really want to, like, open them up, dissect them, see what they have to say, see what the messages here are. They're really smart, really intelligent. But if you don't want to do that, they're still just really fun movies, and that's Hellraiser. Hellraiser is a movie with a lot to say, but it still manages to be a fun, exciting horror movie. It's, I, I've called it my, uh, my favorite gross film, or my grossest favorite film, because there are movies grosser than Hellraiser. There are movies grosser than Hellraiser that I really enjoy. But nothing is as gross as Hellraiser that is better than Hellraiser. This is the best. This is the absolute pinnacle of really gross filmmaking. It is extremely gory. It is one of the goriest movies out there. But, I, I mean, like I said, it's a, it's a BDSM movie. It's BDSM horror movie. And, like, holy fucking shit, dude. There's so much going on in this movie. It's it's really thematically interesting. It's about sort of the the intersection between pain and pleasure and how ultimately there's not much difference between the two. How how similar pain and pleasure can be at times and and also like the weird interplay between sex and religion. There's a lot of religious stuff going on in this movie that's also really smart. <laughs> I could write a book on all the shit that's going on in Hellraiser, on, on how brilliant it is. I, I'm sure there are books dissecting Hellraiser. Um, it's, it's, it's a really smart movie, but it's also a really fun movie, so yeah, I love it. There's a, there's a part of me that wants to do, like, 
a video essay on this movie that sort of explores the intersection between kink and religion, but I also think that is maybe a little spicy for this channel. That is maybe more than what I typically do on this channel, and I'm also sort of scared I'm not smart enough to make a comprehensible argument about it. To me, all of it makes sense, but it, it all makes sense up here. But if I tried to put it on paper, I can't guarantee that I would be able to convey all the things I want to convey. So I've sort of, uh, I've sort of got that one in the back pocket. It's like, you know, maybe I could do a video essay analyzing Hellraiser and the intersection between kink and religion. But then again, that's a little heavy for this channel, so probably not. It's something I would like to do, but it's not something I am likely to do. Great Blu-ray release. This is an Arrow video release. Fun little uh, audio commentary from Clive Barker. Actually, there's two different audio commentaries here with Clive Barker. One, I think, from 97, and then a more recent one. Um, I, I've only listened to the one from, like, n the 90s. I think it was 97, because he, he mentions... Uh, like, the Hellraiser sequels, which are not very good. And he, he specifically mentions one that came out in the late 90s, having just recently released. Uh, not Clark Barker's only movie, although undoubtedly his best one. He also did Fright Night, I think? And... <sighs> something else. Oh, he did Candyman! <laughs> he directed Candyman! Um... Which recently got a remake. Love that remake. Brilliant remake. Um, I wonder what Clive Barker thinks of it. I would like to know Clive Barker's thoughts on the, the Candyman remake. Man, I didn't even talk about the actors in this movie. It's, it's well performed as well. Um, shoot, who plays the dad? Andrew Robinson. Uh, he's, he's a good actor. He's been in uh, a couple of other things that I've seen, although, shoot, I can't think of what he has been in offhand. And in, they, they don't list anything on the back of the box, unfortunately. Um, but he's a good actor. I've seen him in other stuff that's good. And, of course, we we cannot mention, we, we, we cannot forget to mention uh, the, the brilliant Doug Bradley as Lead Cenobite who would later be called Pinhead in all, all the subsequent... I think that was a fan name. The fans started calling him Pinhead, and it, it just stuck. He was credited as lead Cenobite in this movie, and he's brilliant. Like, that's the reason there are so many Hellraiser sequels, is because Doug Bradley showed up, and he's like, yep, yep, I'll be, Hell, I'll be, I'll be Pinhead, and... Yeah, he's the best part of a lot of those sequels. Uh, apparently, because <laughs> he's in, like, heavy makeup through a lot of the movie, so he showed up to, like, the rap party, and no one knew who he was, and he's like, you're kidding me, we we've been talking for, like, mo we've been working on this picture for months now, like, how do you not recognize me? It's it's me, Doug, Pinhead. And I, oh, oh, I didn't recognize you out of makeup. Good, uh, yeah. Hellraiser, if you can stomach it, because I, I will say it's it's a lot to deal with, so it's not going to be for everyone. But if you can handle it, my god, I love this movie. Please, please watch Hellraiser. One of the greatest movies ever made. There you go, that, that episode was a little longer than last time, you know? I... I because I liked the movies I was talking about. I had plenty to say about them. Uh, let's move on to some comments. Uh, last time I asked uh, if you could adapt a book. Uh, what book would you adapt? And I also asked if you wrote a book, who would you want to adapt the book you wrote? So uh, Henry Koslick says, book I'd love to adapt. Harry Potter. Why? It would be universally hated. It would be the death of unnecessary cash grab remakes in Hollywood and an insult to a generation raised on actors who were perfectly cast in every way. 
So I'd be adapting it just to make a quick buck and hopefully force the industry to take a look at itself in the mirror. Uh, Henry, I hate to break it to you, if Hollywood hasn't already stopped and looked at themselves in the mirror, a, a Harry Potter remake is not gonna help. Like, have you seen some of the shit they made? They made an emoji movie, okay? A Harry Potter remake makes too much sense, honestly. Like, this, you're, we're, we're well past the point of, oh, you're, this is totally disrespectful to something I, I loved and grew up with. We're, we're way past that. I don't, I don't think Hollywood is ever gonna stop and look at themselves in the mirror. Especially as long as they're making money, you know? Like, who gives a shit? We're making money. He also says, if I wrote a book about my years at UPS... As an underpaid, overworked middle manager, I'd love Rob Zombie to direct because we 100% had some Walking Dead in that building. Uh, that'd be an interesting direction for Rob Zombie to go. He's working on a Monsters movie, apparently, and I'm like, Monsters is a little family-friendly for Rob Zombies. Is this gonna be, like, aggressive Rob Zombie monsters, or is he gonna try to make this, like, a family affair? But, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to see a, a Rob Zombie movie set in, like, a UPS center. I, be an interesting, I, I mean, Rob Zombie's an interesting director. Not always a good director, but an interesting director. Uh, John August says a book trilogy that he would love to see adapted into a movie is the Thrawn trilogy from the old Star Wars EU. Uh, they, they were, like, the really popular ones that people considered, like, the official follow-ups to Star Wars. Like, if you were gonna accept anything in the EU, it was gonna be these three books. Um, and he says he, he'd get Steven Spielberg to direct them. Uh, you know, because he's friends with George Lucas, and he's a good director. Um, mm, might, might be better than the sequel series we got. I don't know. I, I like the first two. I like seven and the first half of eight. I like, I like eight up until the third act. The third act kind of sucks. Episode nine can blow me. Fuck episode nine. I, I'm not even... Counting out episode 9 as canon. I'm just like, oh, that's so weird that they stopped at episode 8. That's that's weird that they left us on such a cliffhanger. Too bad there's no episode 9. As some, something I don't see people talk about a lot. In, in episode 8, when, like, Yoda destroys the sacred uh, Jedi texts, that's clearly supposed to be the star, like, metaphor for Star Wars EU, right? That's... That's what that scene is supposed to represent, like, hey, you know, the, the EU, yeah, it's great, there's a lot of it, but, uh, let's, we're gonna get rid of it so that someone else can start something new. That's, n not enough people talk about that. That's, cl that's clearly what that scene is, right? Like, I, I figured that out in the theater. I'm like, oh, this is a metaphor for the Star Wars EU, right? And no one talks about that. No one has mentioned that. Uh, so I, I sometimes I wonder if I'm alone in that, but I'm like, this is clearly commentary on the Star Wars EU, right? I don't know. It it might have been better to adapt the books than than get the sequels we got. Um, not that I dislike all of the sequels, but you know, I think fans would have been happier with uh, book adaptations. I I guess I didn't answer the question. <laughs> Um, geez, I don't know, man. My favorite books are, like, I, I like all of, uh, Douglas Adams' books, but Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was not a very, it, it was fine, it was an okay movie, um, and I don't know that you could tur turn Dirk Gently into a movie. Um, I think it's a TV series on BBC, I haven't watched the TV series, but... I would like to. I love the Dirk Gently books. So, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Uh, maybe... A lot of the books I read are, like, nonfiction. And it's like, you know, I, I could convert some of these into a movie. I would love to direct 
uh, an adaptation of The Disaster Artist, honestly. I know there was the James Franco one a few years ago, and it's, it's fine, it's fun, but it's a James Franco comedy movie, and I think it misses out on a lot of the deeper stuff in that book. If I wrote a book, I would want me to adapt it. I would I would go full Clive Barker, Stephen King, Michael Crichton, William Blady, and just uh, adapt my own book. Well, it's October 1st, although I'm actually not going to do this till October 2nd, because uh, I, I have to do something tonight. I'm busy tonight, so we're going to do this tomorrow night. But it's October 1st, which means it's Metalween! And time to talk about some Metalween movies. Uh, so my question this week is, uh, what's your favorite Halloween music? What's, what's a, like some music you like to put on during Halloween? Like songs or, or albums, playlists, artists you like to put on during Halloween? First up, we have Dia de la Bestia, or Day of the Beast, Spanish movie. Following that up, we have Luigi Cazzi's Paganini Horror, or Paganini Horror. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that. Luigi Cazzi. And finally, we have the, what is this, Danish? Finnish. Finnish comedy movie, Heavy Trip. Yeah, that's our uh, Metal Ween triple feature for next time. So uh, until next time, happy Metal Ween.